this session, starting with me and a, a very interesting um, talk that we will have afterwards, we're going to delve into the, the co-benefits of RED, or what I like to call them, the multiple benefits of RED. Because obviously, if you're a community or, or people working in the field to reduce emissions, you're more interested in the benefits you're going to get from that than actually you know, reducing emissions and, and climate change mitigation. So depending on what your perspective is, this, this can be the most important part of RED. And um, I'm going to go into some of the details, those kind of nuts and bolts of how the, the standards work and how they link up with the VCS and, and the registries that you heard about earlier. So you had a bit of an, an introduction just then um, about the CCBA. Uh, it's an, it's a, a partnership of NGOs, um, international NGOs, that came together actually in 2003. So that's 10 years ago. That's a long time in the world of forest carbon. And we've worked to um, develop standards through a participatory process. We've had advisors um, in the process from uh, leading um, forestry research institutes around the world. And there are two initiatives that we ha are, are leading. One is the CCB standards I'm going to talk about today. They're standards for site-based projects um, used by projects in, in the voluntary market. And another initiative is the Red Plus Social and Environmental Standards. And these are standards that we've been developing to support government-led programs, programs of policies and measures for RED that may be implemented at a national level or a, a state level, a state in Brazil or province in Indonesia, for example. I'll talk more about the, the CCB standards just now. So we've heard a lot about the, the positive benefits of RED, and, and they can be very positive. They can, uh, RED can conserve or restore habitats and endangered species. It's, it's um, uh, protect watersheds and soil and, and enhance agricultural productivity when you're helping people to find um, new and different livelihoods that, that don't rely on cutting down trees, create new employment and, and different kinds of livelihoods, an opportunity, as we're going to hear about sharing revenues from the red uh, market and, and finding things to do with that that, that uh, help to communities not just to meet their needs but also their aspirations of what they want to do with development. Um, help those who are forest dependent and have traditional cultures to maintain those livelihoods and cultures as they want to. And very importantly for them, for indigenous people, to recognize customary rights to land and resources that may not yet be recognized formally under statutory law but um, could Red is actually can be a way of enhancing, securing those rights, so they actually become statutory rights because their role in maintaining the forest is recognised, and and you can't move forward in, in red without that. So there's lots of potential positives, but we are talking about an initiative that changes the way that land is used and forest is used against what would have happened otherwise. So you're you're changing how people use forests and, and, and the different forces that, and, and drivers that affect that. And it can be negative. And I've started with the biodiversity negatives here. And you may think, well, what are the biodiversity negatives of red? Well, actually, you're, what you're doing is, is trying to enhance the carbon stocks or maintain carbon stocks against what would have happened otherwise. So if you have a low carbon ecosystem, you know, like a savanna ecosystem or a wetland ecosystem, you could actually decide to plant trees there, which may be positive, or it could end up with a monoculture that, that, that has some negative impacts, um, or, or could have some imbalance using genetically modified organisms and, and losing natural pollinators or whatever. So that, there can be negative impacts, either through leakage or through growing trees in, in a place that you're actually causing a negative impact on the, on the local natural ecosystem, a lower carbon ecosystem. But then specifically, and, and many of the indigenous peoples groups have really raised awareness of this, that they, they, RED has helped them, in fact, in some ways, to become more organized, to, to talk about their rights. Um, they're worried about restrictions or, or denying access to land that, and, and resources that they've traditionally used, um, about the fact that this could, new influences could degrade Tra traditions, maybe cause some kind of social conflicts, fighting over how you get to use the money, power changes in the balances of power. And particularly, we're concerned about 
um, how some groups within the larger community, maybe women or, or indigenous peoples who've not traditionally had maybe such a strong voice, but but are, are, um, ha have uh, their rights and, and their interests, but other vulnerable and marginalized groups in, in, um, in Nepal, it's the, the Dalit groups, you know, different, different groups in different parts of the world uh, can potentially um, assume some of the more of the opportunity costs than others if they don't have a voice and, and their interests are not taken into account. So how do the standards work? Standards, you know, as we've heard about BCS, they're, they're criteria that are used consistently as rules, guidelines, or characteristics to ensure the quality of materials, products, processes, and services. That's a definition. What, what they help you to do is define some criteria that can be used um, objectively to identify the key elements of quality assurance. And then you use them through a consistent process. So, in our case, public consultation, uh, requirements on transparency, independent audit, validation and verification. And this helps to ensure consistency across sites and countries and to formulate the requirements in a, in a way that's clear for the stakeholders, be they local people, governments, um, the buyers and the project developers. <laughs> So in developing the CCB standards, we followed the International Social and Environmental Labeling Alliance. It's actually an alliance for social and environmental standard setting, and they have a code of good practice. And the, the things you'll see on the left there are, are the kind of elements or key elements of that process. To publish um, the, the process of how you're going to do the revision or the development, to create a, a balanced multi-stakeholder committee that includes people from who may be affected by the standards or experts with expert knowledge, to, to follow the process of 260-day uh, public comment periods and to publish all the comments you receive and the response to comments. So we started development of these standards in 2003, 2004. The first edition came out in 2005. That was before the Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol or, and before you know, the, the carbon market had really got going. I joined in 2007. We then did a full revision um, through these public comment periods, et cetera. And we're now, interestingly and excitingly, doing another revision. So any of you who are interested in the CCB standards and, and the developments we're making and the changes, listening, we're listening a lot at the moment to input from various people, from indigenous people, from other groups, and from the project developers, um, and, and from the buyer side as well, to know wh what is important, what are the key issues, have we got it right? So just a sort of snapshot of how it works. Um, with the climate side, as we heard from Jeremy, you need to define a reference scenario or a baseline uh, of what would have happened otherwise. And with CCB standards, you say, well, what would that land use scenario look like? What would be the uh, outcomes for local people and for biodiversity? Uh, would there be ongoing degradation of biodiversity? Would people get displaced from their lands, etc.? And then you also have to, and so you have to establish that um, in using the CCB standards criteria. You also have to identify any high conservation value areas. That's a, a concept that's used in other standards as well, like the Forest Stewardship Council standards, and um, in which you identify areas of importance for endangered species or for protected areas, but also for um, traditional um, livelihoods, uh, cultural identity, and for critical ecosystems, etc. Uh, critical uh, ecosystem services. You need to identify the rights holders and stakeholders. You need to show how the project has done a full and effective consultation process, that it's followed free, prior, and informed consent for those whose rights will be affected by the project. That's a very important concept, and it's hard sometimes to know how it's done and whether it's been done correctly, and that's part of our job, is to try to work out what are the criteria so that people from the outside know that this project has followed a strong process of free, prior, and informed consent, and people aren't being coerced um, or worse into a, a new way of life. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, this important, important importance of uh, recognizing customary rights um, and through, with the CCB standards, you basically have to demonstrate net positive benefits for communities and for biodiversity. For communities, it's actually for each of the subgroups that you identify within the community. So um, if there are some, such as women, who have a different use of resources than other groups, then you need to check, well, what are the impacts on women? 
uh, and monitor the impacts uh, on site, off site, etc. So the validation and verification process, so like VCS through an approved third party auditor, all the documents are published on the web. There's a 30 day public comment period for each project and those comments are sent to the auditor. They have to address them in the audit report. There's a site visit by the auditor and they, there's a maximum verification period of five years from the last verification or, or validation. Verification is important because it's actually when you check has the project delivered what it said it was going to do. Have they implemented the project according to the uh, validated design? So, you know, since that, those early beginnings, when I joined in 2007, there were just two projects that had been validated. And so over a short time period, I'd say the majority of, of projects in the forest carbon sort of development are using or planning to use the CCB standards. Um, There is a, a, a list of, not in any way a full list, but you'll see a lot of household names amongst the NGOs and the corporations and those who are more in the know, you know, down in the um, private sector and, and brokers and retailers using the CCB standards. So now we've got to the position, I think um, Molly mentioned it, that sort of emerging out of just who's using what in the voluntary market, we're finding uh, projects using uh, and, and buyers seeking the VCS for the credibility of greenhouse gas reductions and CCB standards for assurance on the social and environmental quality. And what they're looking for, and the reason why they're interested is they want to know has this, been project, this project been developed through a kind of holistic design. Um, they're concerned about getting involved with a project that may have violated rights or, or, or created, um, you know, caused endangered species to become more endangered. Uh, Interestingly, and I, I think you know, this is an important driver, a project that has addressed local community issues and, and actually made, given them really positive incentives for changing the way they use the land um, and has uh, sort of developed in, in a way that it, it integrates into the, the whole ecosystem is actually going to produce more red credits. So as, a, as an investor or, or, or from, the, from the demand side, you're actually looking for projects that have got this right. Um, and the same on sustainability. You know, that translates into permanence. There are various um, uh, penalties if your project ha shows risks of non-permanence, of having to keep more credits in a, in a buffer. It's a system that, that VCS has pioneered. Uh, and showing that you, your project has good strong social support from local people and, and, and is well integrated, can help you reduce those risks of non-permanence. Um, obviously people, you know, we're all human and we're interested in human conditions and uh, it, it's, it, it's often of, of great interest to find a project that, that you can make some connection with, not just because it's reducing emissions, but also because it's helping people in a very tangible way and it, it's conserving biodiversity. And then we've introduced a new um, mechanism. Well, it's not so new now, but we're uh, in, in sort of agreement with VCS and the registries where you can add, I think David uh, mentioned this, you can add just a CCB label to voluntary carbon, verified carbon units uh, issued on a registry if they've been verified to CCB standards. So validation, just saying you're going to do a good project isn't enough, they have to be verified as well. So um, Molly's um, State of the Forest Carbon Market report showed us that um, the majority, you see all the kind of green segments show uh, how many uh, of the projects out there uh, are using the CCB standards mostly in combination with VCS but also in other combinations. And we also got, very interestingly, uh, our first um, evidence of a premium. You know, generally CCB standards is helping with market access. You know, it makes it more, um, uh, uh, people feel more confident about purchasing an offset or, or getting involved with a project. But it's also helping actually to uh, to stabilize prices and increase prices with a premium. We showed, um, it showed 50 cents in a ton um, against an average VCU price. So that the price with the CCB was 
uh, tons f per credit. No, uh, dollars per credit, sorry. So just briefly on the red SES, it's a framework um, for government-led projects and the government-led programs of policies and measures, and it's implemented, you see red SES process through a country-led multi-stakeholder assessment. So rather than do an independent third-party audit, it puts a lot of emphasis on involving the stakeholders in assessing the quality of a red program. Um, and there are now 13 different countries uh, or states uh, in Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, and others that have adopted this, this comprehensive framework. And it can be used alongside the VCS uh, jurisdictional and nested red initiative. So just in summing up, um, you know, I think you know this anyway, but just to emphasize it once more, that the social and biodiversity quality is, is absolutely key for red to move forward, not just to uh, ethically, but also effect for effectiveness and e efficiency. Um, and so by respecting communities' rights and interests and promoting effective participation, it helps to enhance effectiveness for quantity of your credits, for sustainability, for permanence, to generate multiple benefits that help sustainable development and biodiversity conservation. I mentioned the importance of facilitating market access, potentially leading to a premium, but that's still, I suppose, waiting to be seen as the market matures. And, um, but particularly as a means to screen out reputational risk or projects you don't want to get involved with for some reason. Um, and in many cases also can be useful for um, demonstrating compliance with safeguards requirements. As, as, and we hope this will happen, you know, there are more compliance opportunities for RED, maybe through the California market and others, there's going to be requirements for safeguards. And these kinds of standards, are, and CCB standards, RED plus SES, are a way of demonstrating that those high standards are being met. Um, and ultimately, of course, both from developing countries' point of view, but also from, you know, all of you and, and the developed world and, and the potential users of offsets, it's a way of building support for RED and, um, and ultimately for climate mitigation action. So um, thank you very much. Thank you.